welcome everyone. Welcome to the show. It's me, Mike Cavalli. No Linda again this week. Uh, that was pre-planned in case you missed last week's show. Hopefully she'll be back uh, next week. Uh, she's up to her neck in it, which is great. Um, the other news that we have is that there is no more open door. Uh, Katerina is also up to her neck in it. And um, look, there's no hard feelings. I've no, known her a long, long enough. We're very good friends. She's very busy with this festival uh, and the scripts that she's writing. So as with all of us, time is precious. Um, so... Yeah, she might pop back in occasionally, but uh, we'll we'll see. We'll see uh, what happens there with her. Um, what is interesting, what's it, quite exciting is that Linda, as with me, as with Katarina, as with everyone, here's something uh, that Jeanne d'Arc said, uh, and this applies to actually the three of us, but at the moment, more so Linda and more so Katarina. Uh, I'm playing a little bit of catch up here uh, because I've got an exciting project I want to tell you about, about Jeanne d'Arc. It's delayed again this week, uh, so hopefully I'll have the promo out ready for next week and I can tell you all about it. But here is the uh, uh, one of the greatest quotes uh, from Jeanne d'Arc, which we can all apply to. It says, every man gives his life for what he believes. Every woman gives her life for what she believes. Some people believe in little or nothing, and so they give their lives to little or nothing. One life is all we have, and we live it as we believe in living it, and then it's gone. But to surrender who you are and to live without belief is more terrible than dying, more terrible than dying young. I think that's great, but to surrender without belief. And I think many of us have fallen into that trap of surrendering without belief, or in the very le least have the belief, but don't have the, the energy to go out and do something with this belief that they have. So um, if none of you, uh, if this is the first time you're here, uh, I do a weekly report with Jeanne d'Arc uh, called the Jeanne d'Arc Prophecies and I'm gonna hopefully got the right uh, link there that I've just put up for you to see it's in the comment section I just put it up there uh, on the broadcast as well but if you just go to Medium Mike Cavalli and you'll find the Jeanne d'Arc uh, spiritual report um, so that's uh, what we're up to so far this week with Jeanne d'Arc. There were some interesting questions about Jeanne d'Arc. And if you go to the website, uh, the, the YouTube page, you'll see uh, some interesting question. Uh, somebody put in, uh, Dear Jean, we often reminded to find out who we really are. Did you come to the full understanding of who you really are? before you left your physical body. Uh, and you see when we start talking about Jean, how the table really starts moving and getting energetic. Were you told you would not feel any pain at the stake and had no fear whatsoever? Thank you. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I know a shaman, she doesn't do it anymore, but she could walk on fire. That's right? slightly different than being burnt at the stake, but yeah, I mean, it is to do with vibration and energy levels. Also, did your vibration in any way become higher than the earthly vibration of fire? So no pain could be felt by it or by any other means of physical death of the body. These are some of the questions. But one of the most interesting ones was uh, somebody made a comment. Uh, I think it was uh, Sari here that says she supposedly lived in Derbyshire on some land that is a sacred site called Bebbington Castle. Well, I've never actually uh, heard of that myself with my long association with, with Jean. Uh, but I'll ask her that question. As far as I understand, her last uh, incarnation on the earth plane was her campaign in 1428. Um, and that was that was her lot. Uh, sorry, asked, could could you explain who Jeanne d'Arc is, please? Uh, oh, blimey, where do we begin with this? Uh, a very brief 
ex explanation is that she heard voices from God, that she was to uh, crown the king uh, of France, make him the true heir of France, and to boot the English out of, uh, out of France. Uh, um, and this was basically the end of the Hundred Year War. It's a, it's a very, very deep uh, subject, and it's not at all like the pop history tells us about Jeanne d'Arc. Um, sorry, you'll be very interested in the project that uh, I'm doing, which, fingers crossed, I will reveal uh, next week. Anyway, it's time to get on with the show. Uh, and we're back to our old friends again, uh, ghosts behaving badly. We're going to see uh, some poltergeist activity and a, a ghost a shadow figure uh, moving about uh, the house, um, which we can discuss, I think. Um, so Sarah says, thank you today. She would be put in a hospital. Uh, absolutely, she would be put in a hospital. Uh, one of the questions uh we, we do know from uh, um, psychologists who study uh, medieval history, particularly women, is that she would have absolutely have been put in uh, some kind of institution back then. But her power was so strong and had the support of so many people that it would have uh, been a very, very disastrous act for her to be institutionalized in the way they did in those days so instead they decided to charge her with heresy and burn her at the stake um, for heresy not actually for booting the English out of France and causing uh, what uh, was perceived as mayhem anyway back to <laughs> ghosts behaving badly we got two segments here let's take a look at them and uh, get your thoughts on them Our first clip of the day was captured by a home security camera back in November 2022. It was uploaded to TikTok by Destroyer667. It begins with a young girl talking to her dad as she plays on the computer. The dad says he's going to take a shower and that she should finish up and go to bed. But after the dad leaves, things turn weird pretty quickly. Watching that again, two of the dining room chairs seem to slide across the floor all on their own. The girl gets up startled, calling out to her dad. Her reaction looks quite genuine, and unless someone in the family's playing a prank on this poor girl, you have to wonder what's really being caught on camera here. The car was uploaded to TikTok by Edward Ramirez. At first, everything seems perfectly normal as a woman heads downstairs of her apartment, but watch what happens next. A transparent figure in a white dress appears from the top right hand corner of the screen. She lingers, then disappears. Shortly after, a chair slides across the floor. Caught me off guard a little bit. Um, okay, let's take a look. Um, the first one there with that, that young girl, uh, the presenter there says, uh, I don't, uh, she says, she moved away startled. She didn't look startled to me. I, I thought she moved away really quite uh, effectively, very calmly, um, and went off to see her father. She didn't seem startled. She seemed as though she knew something was going on, 
but she wasn't going to freak out. Um, so that was that is uh, my take on it. I don't think there was anyone under the chair, under the table. You could say that with the first one, that there was someone under the table. Uh, but with the second chair that tilted, I th would have thought you'd seen a fingertip or something uh, because the angle that needs to go over, it has to be pushed from the front. So unless there was a string that we never saw, I don't know. Um, the second one, I kind of feel that was a fake ghost put in there. I know the story. Uh, there's a bit of a backstory with this one. And that is that uh, they speak about the lady in white uh, near this house. And I think it's to do with the lake. I mean, it's always to do with the bloody lake, isn't it? Um, but uh, nonetheless, they put a lady in white here and she looks very Victorian, very old fashioned. Uh, this is archetypical of, I think personally, when you want to um, do something a little bit tricky, this is the type of thing they would do. But the chair moved. So again, unless this is photoshopped uh, or there's string there, I would say this is fake. And I would say it's fake. Uh, and that chair was moved somehow with some kind of trickery. So what do you think? Um, let me know your thoughts. Let me know your, your comments. And um, maybe we can discuss this. So that's our first section of the ghosts uh, behaving badly. And if you do have your own story about a ghost or an experience, a haunting or something like that, please let me know. You don't have to come on camera. You can uh, write it down and I'll read it out or you can record it as audio uh, and we'll try and put some images on the background to it to make a, a little video of it. Um, but it'd be nice to share uh, your story if you've experienced something uh, in your home like this. So moving on, we've got the fascinating story or the fascinating reincarnation of Peter Hume. And what's interesting about this one, that this reincarnation doesn't just take place in one spot. We go to a, another part of the UK where this reincarnation concludes with uh, an amazing twist to it. So let's watch this video and then I've got some comments I'd like to make after and see if you guys would like to make some comments. Um, well, at the moment, my mouse is stuck, so I can't actually... Ah, there we go. It's uh, back running again. Let's watch this video. Peter and Bob began their quest for the truth about Peter's past life in the tiny Nottinghamshire village of Halem. There's the church. This is it. You even got this the name right. right. Gosh. And these trees weren't there. I'll tell you, that's 150 years ago. Oh, this is Does definitely look, the church. Is that the same? shadow of a doubt. We went into the church. Luckily, it was open. And as soon as Peter entered, he said, there's something wrong. Well, hang on this a bit, hang on a bit, what? hang on a bit. What's wrong? You see where that altar is up yes, there? Yeah, yes. Well, I tell you, yeah. 350 years ago, the altar was this end. This end? So, Why would they I mean, you can see, the pews have actually been changed complete, well, I wouldn't, completely I wouldn't. around. Baffled by the fundamental change, <laughs> Peter and Bob sought out church warden Richard Brown. That altar's been there since the church was built, what, 700? or over years ago, it, it's never moved. The altar has been there all the time. However, working on a hunch, Richard uncovered old plans of Halem Church. But in 1890s, the church was altered. So when John Raphael walked into the church in his day, he would look to his right and there would be the altar. So Peter would be uh, correcting what he was saying general questions to Peter to gather information for our research. He suddenly became agitated and moving about on the, on the seat he was on. Tell me, what's going on? There's altars. The fighting. The eyes of all the bee would pour down our throats. I remember that we had our pike staffs at the ready. We attacked Newbury on the 17th of September, 1643. Then everything went black. The Battle of Newbury is recorded by historians and at the time is being fought on the 27th of September. 
but it was definitely the 17th of September. So we've got a shortfall of some 10 days from what's claimed. One reason for that might be there was a change in calendar in 1752 when we actually went from the Julian Gregorian calendar and we lost oak 10 trees. days. Oh. It's hardly changed. Oak trees. Hardly changed in all those Look years. Look at that. This has got to be. There's nothing on here. This is it. This is it. I was able to pinpoint where it was. Definitely. Oak trees again. This is it. As we got to the edge of the um, embankment, that's when the ravine appeared. And my initial reaction was. It hasn't changed at all in the last 350 years. I couldn't believe it. There's this river. You see, it's it's just a stream the river used it. to be quite right high. Yeah. You you couldn't miss it. Yeah. I remember we would sit around the campfire, we'd play cards, sing songs. We'd also carve initials on trees. Well, the brothers came to see me about three or four years ago um, and told us about this, this campsite. Uh, but uh, our records had no information about campsites at all. Come on then, guys, let's go look. Let's have a look at this. Undeterred, the brothers armed themselves with metal detectors to see what evidence they could unearth. And I'm bringing us to this, to this site. We've started to do some metal detecting. And these are some of the articles, or the artifacts that are coming out of the ground. We appear to have two musket balls, possibly from the Civil War period. A love token, which is a, a, used to be a coin, but had a, an initial stamped in it. Left hand, I've got part of a broken spur. Well, they were all scattered around. Oh, Most of the foot soldiers were along yeah. here. So could yeah. these artefacts mean that the brothers had discovered a previously yeah. unknown Civil War campsite? We're actually left with some quite convincing information, I think. Musket balls, uh, a spur here, some of the buckles and things do certainly argue that we're looking at a campsite where people could have camped overnight during this Civil War period. Now, at that particular time, I thought that he meant my real-life daughter, Karen, who lives in uh, near Loughborough. Well, I picked the phone up. And I said, I'm really not a loony, and I'm phoning from London, and I was your daughter in a previous life. Now, my first reaction was, this woman is stark raving mad. <laughs> I said to Barbara, do you remember on either your fifth or your sixth birthday on the farm. She said, yes. I said, can you remember what I made you? She said... Uh, for my sixth birthday, he made a horse out of wood. I said, that's correct. I said, what else? And put green and yellow ribbons around it. <laughs> Happy birthday! Could Barbara Hartfield really be the daughter of John Raphael? <laughs> Peter is convinced. She's mentioned a couple of things that she couldn't possibly have known about unless she was my daughter. Back on the road, Peter and Bob head for London and the Clink Prison in pursuit of their latest lead. Mm. This, this could very well be the place. Well, it's, it's apparently on the side, the Black the Friars. Entrance, you said Black Friars. When I was yes. thrown down the steps, it was very similar to this, Rob. And I you said down, didn't you? This That's is down. So. Ooh. Arrested after a pub brawl, Peter suspects he was jailed in the Blackfriars area. Rosemary Smith, lecturer at the Clink Museum, joined the brothers. Some trouble started with some of the locals in there. I remember furniture being thrown around. Mm. And the next thing I remember is coming in a place very similar to this. This might be the right place. Mm. Being thrown down some stone steps and one rips into my thigh. And the pain was terrible. If you were caught drunk and disorderly, which, which you were, yes. or if you were a debtor, this is the place that you would have been thrown yes. in. <laughs> if Peter Hume really did have a past life, maybe he'll have another life after this one. He might even visit Birmingham one day on a quest to learn about the life of Peter Hume and end up watching a rerun of this program. In part <laughs> How about that? Running a, uh, watching a rerun of your own rerun. Um, <clears throat> a fascinating story. A lot of uh, anecdotal information there. Um, there, were, there I think uh, the church was the only piece of real evidence, I think. The rest of it, we kind of have to believe him or not. Because if we take uh, what his daughter in that past life says, um, you know, when he asks, do you remember what I made you? And she says, yes, a horse. We only have his word that she's correct. There's there's nothing else there. Um, Sari says she can't believe it. I'm not sure if you mean you don't believe it or man, I can't believe this. 
<laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, that's a comment. So how did he know? How did he know all this? What was the purpose of his reincarnation? He meets his then daughter and he actually corrects the timeline from the uh, historian. As he points out, we went from Julian to Gregorian, so that would account for the time difference. So that is something that we can actually take into account as some kind of evidence. We also have an archaeologist who had no idea of anything that was going on there. They had no account of it, yet he managed to uh, bring his equipment down there and they found information in the form of these little cannonballs and some trinkets that were from that Civil War period. So a lot has been going on there. I kind of think, yeah, there's more to this uh, this story than what we're actually reading. I don't know if it went any further than, than that chapter that we just saw. Also, Michael Aspel, who presented that program, uh, you may know him over in Australia because uh, he did spend a lot of time there. Um, I don't think he would particularly do a show that would ruin his reputation by it being so daft. So I think it was very cleverly scripted. And I think it's presented in a way, this particular case, for you to uh, open your mind and, and share your own opinions with this. So, yeah, it's it's one of those reincarnation stories. And do you have a reincarnation? Can you remember a reincarnation uh, story? Uh, we spoke earlier about Jean, and I mentioned that her last incarnation was her campaign in 1428. Um, I'll, I'll get that checked again. My only, not even recollection, but for a past life regression or uh, from what other mediums have told me, um, and not in the context of, oh, you was with Jeanne d'Arc in her campaign, but giving me names and information that puts it all in context to the past life regression. Um, I was there in that campaign, but I seem to have not learnt my lessons and have had to travel down through the ages. I think this is my last time, folks. Fingers crossed. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so yeah, do you have a reincarnation story? Can you remember a reincarnation story? Do you remember a pre-birth story, for example? Um, again, very interested to hear your story. So moving on, we've got uh, a story here. And I think this is great. You know, we make a last will and testament, but we never make a, uh, a new will and testament or a, a, a pre or a post will and testament. In other words, we, we never make a, a, an agreement that when we cross over to the other side, how we're going to connect with our loved ones. Um, and this is what this story is about. And I actually think that it would be a good idea if we do have the opportunity uh, when we know a loved one is passing to try and make some uh, new will and testament as to how we're going to connect once I'm over the other side. In the very least, this will add comfort to the people that have been left behind. Um, of course, Christianity doesn't really want us to do that. Um, Christianity teaches us something different. And this is the, the difference between uh, us, for example, and the animal kingdom, who do not fear death. It's just a transition into the next, next world. Uh, really, they do not fear oh my God, they're going to kill me, they're going to euthanize me, they're going to put me to sleep. No, no, they just, okay, and we go into the next world. And it would be quite a beautiful thing if we could find somehow a way of accepting a transition into another world. But the Christian belief, I can only speak from the Christian belief, is that they put so much fear into dying and we got to step out of this. And I think this story actually 
gives us one example of how a couple uh, made an agreement on how they will communicate when one of them passes into the spirit world. And many of you in Australia will know uh, this character that's uh, involved in this particular story. Has one of the most famous faces in Australia. Actor, comedian, TV star. His actress wife, Val Jelle, has her own successful career. So it's fair to say the Fields family is pretty worldly. But when it comes to talk of contact with the other side, Mori and Val have some pretty definite views. After all, they believe they've witnessed contact. I don't think it matters if you're um, religious or superstitious, but there are things you wonder about the hereafter. We discussed it, my mother and I, um, not in a morbid fashion, just um, common sense. Why didn't somebody ever come back and tell you how great it was if it is wonderful, which we all want it to be? And we decided that whoever died first would stop the clocks, wherever they would be, the other one, on their birthday at 12 o'clock. So if my mother died first, she would stop the clocks wherever I was at 12 o'clock. If I died first, wherever she was, I'd somehow stop the clock. And that way, the other one would know that there was somewhere, really. For years after her mother died, Val remembered that pact every birthday, but there was never a sign of any kind. Certainly no clock stopped at 12. Then came a flight back home from Queensland and maybe a hint of the hereafter. It was only a split second, but it was like the plane wasn't there. And I was somewhere where I had no life, I had no memory, there was no pain, no joy, uh, no friends. No worries, no responsibilities, and uh, it was a feeling as though it was total bliss and purity and uh, so ethereal. And suddenly I was back in the plane, I could hear the motor humming again. And I thought, that's why she hasn't made contact with our secret pact. She had no memory. It, she had no knowledge of life. It's too beautiful there. However, Val had no time to ponder the meaning of that experience. Tragic news awaited her at home. Her father was critically ill and not expected to live. He was past talking or seeing and he was doing that. And I was so close to him, I was whispering in his ear and he mumbled, clouds, clouds. I think Murray heard him. I was standing right beside Val and I heard him say, clouds. And uh, I thought he was just raving on sort of thing because they told us that this was it, but what a strange thing to say, clouds. That week was a turmoil of emotions for Val. Her father's death, his funeral, and her birthday. Murray said, I'm taking you out to lunch at your birthday. We were getting dressed and I went to put my watch on. I always leave it in a certain place. And when I went to put it on, I couldn't find it. I quickly looked at it. It was up the other end of the mantelpiece, under my father's photograph that's always been there. And the safety chain was broken. Not quite the pact, the sign that Val and her mother agreed to. But in the bedroom, Maury was about to play his role in this drama. Now, I'm pretty particular about the 
the way I lay my stuff out on the desk there, I had the money and a little change drawer and that old change thing, you know, on the table. And my watch is always laid out in front of that. But it had been moved along about seven inches and right in front of Al's photo. And it was done up. Like you don't take a watch off and then do it up again. Stupid. So I called Val in and I said, did you move my watch? And she said, no. I, I hadn't moved it. I hadn't moved it and it was done up in front of my photo. I know he always lays it out. I picked it up to look at it, wondering why it was done up. And I noticed that it stopped. And it had stopped at 12 o'clock. Right on 12 o'clock. Strange. Exactly as mother and daughter had vowed it would be all those years ago. A little late, but Val is convinced it was the sign she'd been waiting for. Hmm. So, uh, personally, I think this is not a coincidence. I don't believe in coincidences. This is synchronicity. Perhaps we can say that uh, once you cross over the other side, that the timeline is completely different. And if you're new over the other side, you might not have adjusted to uh, timelines. Uh, and so what seems maybe uh, a few days or a week or a month to you could actually be a couple of years. Um, so, and in any case, um, I think once you cross over to the other side, it, uh, the time isn't really that important. Um, we had an NDE story a while back of, of a man who was flying a plane. He was a military guy and he had this crash and he saw a past, present and future all simultaneously, all at the same time. So things are very much different over the other side. The other uh, explanation is that maybe it was for the, uh, the father had to wait for the father across for whatever reason. Uh, maybe there was um, alignment, needed a vibrational alignment, and it needed the help of the father. There's a, a thousand different scenarios here. The important thing is, if you make an agreement, please don't get despondent if it doesn't happen within the earthly timeline that you were negotiating with, with the loved one that passed over. It doesn't always work like that. Um, and as we've mentioned before, once we're into the spirit world, all laws of the earth plane are suspended. So uh, we see things slightly different once we cross over the other side. And depending on how advanced we are as a soul, uh, we might see things even more different. So, yeah, I recommend we should make a, a pre-death agreement, if you like, you want to call it that, a new life agreement, a new life will and testament to say what it is you're going to do and how you're going to communicate, or a post-life agreement. I think it'd be a good idea to take some advice from an expert on the best way that you can approach this. How can spirit best communicate with you? I know they're, they're doing it um, very much with electronics at the moment. So that might be something uh, worth looking at. Talking of electronics, again, I've mentioned this before, but if this is the first time that, that you've joined us or you haven't joined us in a while, there is a brilliant documentary on Vimeo called Calling Earth. And it's all about communication with spirit uh, using technology answer phones, televisions, um, voice activated uh, recorders. We even uh, see, um, I've forgotten his first name, Van der Broek is the second name, uh, where he has this amazing gift where he points the camera, a digital camera at the wall and starts clicking. And then when you look back and see uh, the, the display, all kinds of people in spirit are there. And this was actually done very much under controlled circumstances to make sure there was no cheating or anything like this. 
So um, highly recommend that, um, Calling Earth. But please also do consider uh, making an agreement, if you can, with, with a loved one. It might help you with, with closure. It might help you, especially if you're a non-believer or sitting on the, on the fence on all of this. It might help give you some kind of closure. So, yeah. And again, if you have uh, um, a story like this or divine intervention of some sort, please let us know, write it down or say it in audio or just point yourself in the camera uh, like I'm doing now and just say it in under five minutes and uh, we'll get that on the air. And it'd be wonderful for real people to share their stories. So, coming up to our last story, here is a real person, Michael Skewer, I think his uh, name is. Uh, many of you uh, may remember him, I think, from, let's see if I can find him. There we are, Trick or Treat. This is his band, heavy metal, big rocker. Um, here's a thing. Many of these heavy rockers we know about, Zeppelin and, and others, are very much into the darker cults um, and the, the dark arts, very much into Satanism. And so we have this impression that the older metal people might be involved in some stuff. It is true to say that the metal music is of a very, very low vibration. Uh, that's not a judgment to say it's good or bad, but it is of a very, very low vibration and can invite all kinds of uh, lower frequencies into your being, especially if you're doing it uh, all the time. And and actually, um, when we see these kinds of pictures here, um, you, you can actually see with all the makeup and God knows what else, it isn't of the highest stuff. But having said that, here we have a case where... Um, Michael, involved in this heavy metal band, but actually has another purpose. So before we go and see this, uh, A. Alexander says, I would love a short call from everyone crossed that they arrived safely. Yeah, um, there's many ways of doing this. And actually, you know, you don't need a medium. You can do this yourself. You just got to trust your intuition. We are all born with this uh, gift to be able to communicate. Oh, by the way, how's your cat, Mike? Uh, well, that's another story. It goes on and on and on. Uh, we seem to think that the cat is, we not seem to think. Let me digress a little bit, people. Uh, we've had an issue with our little white cat. Uh, she is suffering from trauma, that's clear. And she did have a fall. And we now think that these two are separate. We did take her to the vet because she was walking a bit wobbly. But we discovered that she's always in the defense mode. And so her back legs are not always up walking like a confident cat. So they got a little bit weak. So when she would turn quickly, she would almost fall over. But we had her checked out and there's nothing wrong with her um, physically anyway. Um, last night she was sleeping on the couch next to my wife and she suddenly jumped up and freaked out and knocked the cup of tea over when she was asleep. So there's two things here. I know she's emotionally disturbed and at least we know that now we can deal with this. I've got the Healy that we're working on with that. And um, also I've got lovely lady helping us with the healing. Um, and so She's getting getting better. Her habits have changed um, and she's not the cheerful little lady that she was. But we're actually working on that. But fortunately, she is not um, in any physical pain and all her parts are functioning. If you should have seen the contorted position she got herself in yesterday to uh, groom herself you would absolutely know there's nothing wrong with her so thank you for asking about the cat healing please everyone if you could send the healing that would be absolutely beautiful back to michael skewer so you know let's not judge this man uh, or all metal people because clearly this story shows that this man had a purpose coming into life so i was in a bad accident and i remember thinking saying out loud I've just been in a bad accident. 
At that point, the driver comes stumbling over and he puts his head in. All the windows are blown out. Front window, side windows, everything. He puts his head in the window and he's like, Morte? M Morte? I go, no, I'm not dead. Go get help. So he goes stumbling off. I think he's going to get help. Actually, he went home and took a shower and got a beer and waited for the police to call. And then I started to think, I might die. There's nobody around. I can't get, I can't reach my cell phone. It was on the ground. Everything that was on my seat is on the ground. I looked over and there was a man standing looking in the window, a different man. Very nice looking guy, <laughs> dark hair, shoulder length, really white shirt. He said, Michael, how are you? I said, I, I'm fine. I go, am I going to die? He goes, no, you're not going to die. He goes, is there anything I can do for you? I said, yeah, could you pick that stuff up off the floor? I don't know why I asked him to, but I did. So he did. He goes, yes, of course. And he picked up my cell phone and all the other effects that I had that had been thrown onto the floor, put them on the passenger seat. He goes, you're going to be all right. And he reached out his, his arm and I took it and he kept rubbing my, my arm. He said, you're going to be all right. You're not going to die. You're not going to die. I said, okay, 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 all right. Just stay with me. He goes, I'll stay with you until uh, help comes. I said, okay. I feel a lot better. He goes, okay, fine. I'll stay with you. And that was it. He just kept small talk, nothing, uh, just kept holding on to me. And that, that gave me all the comfort I needed. Then he said, help's here. I'm going to go. Remember, you're not going to die. You'll be fine. I said, okay, thank you. And he walked behind, right, right by the police officer who came up, stuck his head in the window and he said, how are you? I go, well, thanks to that guy you just passed, a lot better. He goes, what guy? I'm the only one here. I go, the guy with the white shirt and dark hair. He goes, there's nobody here but me, you, and the people in that van. I'm like, well, then how did all the stuff that was on the floor get on the seat? He's like, I go, he did it. He goes, there's nobody here. I go, well, I couldn't do it. He goes, obviously you can't move. You're pinned in there. I go, where's help? Because you're no help. <laughs> you're starting to scare me because it had been about tw at least a half hour going on a half hour. As soon as I said that, I could hear the sirens and the ambulance was there. Code blue was called because my heart and my breathing had stopped, obviously. Only one nurse was in the room at the time. And that's when I flatlined for three minutes, 58 seconds. So I started to rise, come out of my body, my spirit, and I could look down and see my body thinking, wow, that looks bad. But I started to go up in an angle towards the corner of the uh, operating room, which I thought was odd, but I, that's what happened. And I continued up and I, then I looked back again to see if I could see anything like my, anybody I knew, but I just saw people running in like, and then I was through the ceiling. So I get through the ceiling and it's pitch black, but I could feel motion like I was still moving up and moving up. And I couldn't see anything. It was the blackest black I've ever experienced, but I could feel like I was a part of the, of the black, of the the area I was in, like my spirit was a part of this dark matter. My, my grandfather was there for me as I was growing up and a big part of my uh, spiritual growth. So it makes sense that he would appear to me. So he did, he appears to me. 
I go, Granddad, am I dead? He goes, no. You haven't finished your work on the earth. I'm like, what haven't I done? He goes, you covenanted with the Lord to do a certain thing. You haven't even yet begun to do that. I go, what is that? And he would tell me. He told me three times what it was. I said, but I thought I've been doing that. He goes, you haven't even started it. You have to start doing it immediately. All this time, because I've been back to church, no more band for 10 years, and I thought I was on the straight and narrow path, and apparently I was not. So he told me, and, and this is all thought, this is at the speed of thought, no talking. And the first time and the only time I saw him during the 3 minute 58 second flat line, I would start to look behind him because I could see shapes. And when I would do that, he would notice and then he would speak my name, which sounded like a thunderclap, scared me. And then I'd like, okay, what? And then he'd say it again and say it again. Basically, it's to go back and help people learn about Christ. People that already think they know and people that don't know, but mainly people that already are in church to get them to focus on what's really important, which isn't socializing and all that stuff. It's Jesus Christ. And I'm thinking, you're right, I haven't been doing that. <laughs> Not like I should. So that was it. He was done speaking. I said, so I'll see you again. Yes. And that was it. I opened my eyes and it had been three months. I'd been in a coma. Hmm. Interesting. I, there we have the hard man of, of metal working with this low vibrational music um, and then transforms into evangelizing, if you like, uh, the Ascended Masters. So that's one good reason why I guess when we detach ourselves emotionally from something, uh, we become non-judgmental and we can see things uh, a little more clearly. And isn't it interesting how the divine works? You know, they use, or he, she, the cosmos, uses uh, people as instruments to raise vibration. And God, the divine, the universe, the cosmos, he, she, non-binary, <laughs> Uh, doesn't care about time, doesn't care about what you're doing right now, what you're uh, going to be doing, only cares about that you fulfill your mission, which you agreed to come onto the earth plane for. And finally, this man is beginning to do it. The question is, could he have done this without the car crash? Could he have done this without working in that low vibrational energy of uh, metal music, being involved in that whole scenario? Because we do know that uh, the whole music industry is of the deepest and darkest uh, satanic, I'd go as far as to say satanic um, vibration. I mean, we only have to look at the Grammy Awards to give you an example of the the depth of deprivation that industry has stooped into. And yet there's someone like this that's that's come out um, shining is the only way I can describe it. So um, Rebecca says judgment isn't about persecution or reimbursements. It's about changed behavior, truth, love and wisdom. Absolutely spot on. Uh, hello, James. Uh, glad you can join us. We're just wrapping it up right now, but uh, obviously you can see the rerun of this. So thank you for that, uh, Rebecca, for that for that comment. I think, yes, my clearer understanding since I stepped out of uh, Christian belief patterns is certainly when we cross over the other side, there is no judgment. 
if there is a judgment, it's because we are judging ourselves. There's life reviews. Because a few weeks ago, we showed an NDE of, and she says, you know, damn it, I found myself in hell and I was a good Catholic woman. Why am I here? Well, she was there because, if I remember the story right, because she was told that's where she would go because, you know, you're perpetually being told at that generation. Anyway, how old, or how bad you were. Um, just to give you an example, I grew up um, where we weren't allowed to talk to Protestants, they were called. In other words, Church of England. The problem I had is that two of my uncles married non-Catholics. So what predicament did that put me in? Um, we was told that when we went past a church, a Catholic, only a Catholic church, we had to do the sign of the cross, but not a Protestant church. Uh, all these dogmas um, and the fact that God is looking down on us and he was always looking at our mistakes and never our good things. So I managed to lift myself uh, out of that. And that's why this lady found herself with this hellish experience until she asked, God help me. And straight away it came. And some of the other rare NDEs where people find themselves in that hellish experience, they just ask, ask God for help, Christ for help, and boom, it's done instantly. But I feel these are pretty few and far between. So that's about it. That's the show uh, wrapped up. Don't forget, please do go to the, uh, the YouTube channel there, the Jeanne d'Arc Spiritual Report. And I'd like to say one last thing on that. I think we're going to wrap up uh, the celebrity deaths uh, stories here. Did so-and-so uh, really kill himself or did so-and-so uh, really die naturally? Uh, I think we all know the depths that the uh, music industry can go to. Um, and so I don't think it's worth continuing down that line. What Jeanne likes questions about her life, not for her own ego, but to help us, questions about her life, philosophical questions, spiritual questions, and to a certain degree, where the world is going. Um, and I think that's the way she would like to, to keep it. Uh, I think that keeps the whole vibration going. And as I leave you, I want to leave you with this thought that your thoughts do partially create an outcome. So please be careful with your thoughts. I think it's, you know, thoughts become words, words become actions, habits become actions, actions become character and character becomes destiny. So please be careful with your thoughts because once you make a thought, then you can uh, put that thought into action. It needs both. So if you want peace in this world, which we all do, and you have these peaceful thoughts, then do something in your life, no matter how small, that cre creates peace. Uh, that would be not arguing with people that don't understand your level of the argument. Not all battles are worth fighting for. Uh, if you want more love in the world, uh, do something that creates more love. Give a, a person who's down and out uh, a, a few shillings, a few cents, buy him or her some food. Of course, I'm talking about the genuine ones, not the professional ones. So just do something. And we do create a different world because the world we have today is solely due to our thoughts and our consciousness. And this is why we're seeing more and more higher vibrational uh, people, candidates coming in, into the world because our thought processes are changing. But we need to do more because if we're not, 2023 may be a, still a bit of a rough ride, but we're getting there. So keep joy in your life and watch the ripple effect and watch it all change. This really does happen. I can't express this enough. In the very least, please live without fear. Turn off your radio, turn off your telly, or if you do watch something on the telly, watch something joyful, creative, something that's fun. Do not step back into that, that fear uh, motion because it destroys you, it destroys your life, it destroys everyone's life, and it's not necessary. Look how far we've come and we're still here. 
So let's march on. Um, I want to try and leave you with uh, a, a Jeanne quote, which I can't. It slipped my mind, so maybe she doesn't want me to say it right now. But um, anyway, everyone, have a great week. I'll see you next week. And if you do have any stories, please let me know and we'll get this up on here. So whatever you're doing, peace, love and joy. Let the light in and really roll with it like today is your last day on earth. How would you live if this was your last day on earth? 99.9% .9 of the stuff you wouldn't give a damn about. That's how we should live our life today. Bye, everyone.